To tell you the truth, I've never particularly liked either of these gospel stories. First, Jesus says that there's some sin that I could commit for which I could never be forgiven. Then he completely disowns his entire family. I, for one, find that neither story brings me much comfort. When I read this story, my first instinct is to want to know how I can avoid that particular sin, how I can avoid being disowned by Jesus without the hope of ever being forgiven. Is that also what you're wondering? I just want to know what I have to do or not do or believe or not believe. Um, I just want to know how I can stay in the family, so to speak. I just want someone to tell me the right answer. Well, as it happens, in Jesus' time, there were people whose job it was to know that right answer to questions just like this. They were the experts in the law because they studied it and copied it and wrote it down and interpreted it. These people were called scribes. Yes, that's right, the scribes. The scribes we just heard in the story are the very same ones who had all the right answers. That's why this story is so surprising. These scribes know God better than anyone. Wouldn't you think that they would be able to tell the Holy Spirit from some unclean spirit? But they don't. I think that's why Jesus says that blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, mistaking God for the opposite of God, is an unforgivable sin. Because if these scribes can't recognize God by the very works of God, then the question is, who are they worshiping? You can't get forgiveness from God because you don't even know who to ask for it. You can't repair a relationship that doesn't exist. It's maybe not that God won't grant forgiveness so much as that God can't grant forgiveness because they don't know who to ask. Now, it's not that the scribes are bad or wrong or stupid. Clearly, they aren't. They are intelligent and learned and kept all of God's laws, and they knew them better than anyone. It's simply that knowing all about God is not the same as knowing God. Consider the story from Genesis. Adam and Eve eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they, quote, want to be like God. Well, that begs the question, what does it mean to be like God? Aren't they already like God? I mean, after all, it says just a few verses earlier that God says, let us create humankind in our own image and according to our likeness. And then God gives Adam the job of naming each creature as it's created, thereby inviting Adam to share in God's work of creating. If that's not being enough like God, then what more do they want? Given the name of the tree from which they ate, my guess is they wanted knowledge. Like the scribes, and frankly, maybe like me, they want to know the right answers. They want to know the good, right things to do and be and say and believe, and which wrong answers to avoid. Ironically, this story also implies that God would walk through the garden with them. In other words, anything they wanted to know, they simply could have asked, and God would have told them. I'm sure God would have been happy to share that. But in seeking the right answer, they actually separated themselves from the one whom all the answers are about. Just like the scribes' knowledge of the law kept them from recognizing the Son of God standing right in front of them and the Holy Spirit working in their midst. St. Paul also talks about this. He says that sometimes those things that are most obvious, the things that we see and hear and feel and experience, that they can actually distract us from what's real and true. He says, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner being is being renewed day by day. Martin Luther had a name for the people who only look at the outer nature, the people who are looking for the right answers. He called them theologians of glory, and he said that they call the evil thing good and the good thing evil. We frequently look at things like death and suffering and hardship and pain, and we call them bad. 
But anyone who is familiar with the God revealed in Jesus Christ knows that God often uses these very things to bring about things like resurrection and growth and wisdom and love. In contrast to the theologian of glory, Luther says, the theologian of the cross, the person who recognizes God, uh, who God is, that that theologian calls things what they are. In other words, the theologian of the cross knows that things like this, that most things are not good or bad. They just are what they are. Or to put it another way, that there is no right answer that we can look up in the back of the book to know what we're supposed to do. It's not just that those answers haven't been written down anywhere and that someday we get to read them. It's that they don't exist. Sometimes we talk about, you know, when we die, finally knowing the answers to all of life's questions. What if when that happens, all we realize is that the questions are all there ever were? Let me give you an example. Right now, our congregation is thinking about how to re-enter our building and to gather in a way that's both safe and meaningful. This pandemic has been, as has been often stated, unprecedented. There is no established process for how or when to reopen a church after a pandemic. We're all just figuring this out as we go. And now it's easy to look at other churches or what other states are doing and say, well, why didn't we do this and how come we're doing that? But the truth is that every context and every situation is different. Nobody's ever done this before. There's no right way and no wrong way to do it. Other congregations have gone back in person already. They've got plans and procedures in place. Now, was going back when they did a good idea? Maybe, maybe not. Are their plans and their procedures safe and effective? Maybe, maybe not. Can we learn from them? Absolutely. Should we copy them? Absolutely not. What works in one place for one group of people may not work in another place for another group. Here's another example. Many congregations like ours have stopped doing any kind of Sunday school classes during the pandemic because kids and families are just Zoomed out. They're not going to connect with Sunday school via Zoom. They don't need one more Zoom meeting in a week. Instead, we've been doing grab-and-go kits for families where they can do Sunday school at home. But other congregations have thriving Zoom Sunday school programs where the kids eagerly participate. Now, that could be due to a lot of different factors like content or presentation or parental involvement, but no matter what, the same principle applies. What works in one place for one group of people isn't necessarily going to work in another place for another group. We're all left to figure out what works for us in our context. And as a congregation, that's work that we are called to do together, to figure that out. But here's where it gets interesting is that this doesn't just apply to programs or gathering for in-person worship or pandemics even. I think this is true of faith in general. For generations, we have taught and we ourselves, excuse me, we have been taught and we ourselves have taught that there is one correct set of beliefs or doctrines to hold about God. Our set of beliefs, our religion is correct and everybody else's is incorrect. If you want to be in God's family and receive God's forgiveness, you have to have the right beliefs. But that's not what St. Mark says. That's not what St. Paul says. That's not what I see in the message in Genesis. What I hear in those stories is that sometimes our search for and our devotion to having the right answer or the right belief can actually separate us from God. What if the most important thing is not having the right answers, but continuing to ask questions? Pastor and author Brian McLaren shares a story about his own faith journey growing up in a conservative evangelical tra uh, tradition. As he grew up, he began to doubt those things that he had believed as fact, and that was an agonizing process for him. 
But eventually he came to realization. He writes, Looking back, I now see that underneath the arguments about what I believe to be true factually, something deeper and truer was happening actually. For example, whether or not the creation story happened factually as described in Genesis, I was committing myself to live in the world as if it actually were a precious, beautiful, meaningful creation, and as if I were too. What mattered most was not that I believed the stories in a factual sense, but that I believed in the meaning they carried so I could act upon that meaning and embody it in my life. To let that meaning breathe in me, animate me, fill me. Whether I considered the stories factually accurate was never the point. What actually mattered all along was whether I lived a life pregnant with the meaning that those stories contained. To my surprise, when I was given the permission to doubt the factuality of my beliefs, I discovered their actual life-giving purpose. The reason that we tell these stories and pass on these beliefs is because they have helped people before us experience God, not because they themselves are God. This is what the scribes in the story weren't able to see. They couldn't recognize God apart from the law. And so when God showed up in a way that didn't fit their vision, they couldn't recognize God. But as times change, and as societies change, and as we ourselves change over time, sometimes those beliefs don't always show us to God in the same way. Sometimes we start to see God in other places, outside of our one correct right answer. I believe that the most important gift that a faith tradition has to offer is not teaching us what to think, but rather teaching us how to think. Instead of memorizing from script passages from Scripture and catechisms, I wonder if we would be better served by practicing how to ask deep questions and to look deeply for answers how to let those answers go and seek new ones if and when we need to. Maybe that could help us see the Holy Spirit in our midst, renewing our inner natures, even as our outer natures seem to be wasting away. In fact, I wonder if the real project of Jesus' church in these coming years is not that very thing. The outer nature of the church has been wasting away for decades now. Maybe the time has come for us to do some deep wondering about how and where God is at work renewing our inner nature rather than trying to keep a dying institution on life support. We all want to know what that looks like. We all want to know the right answer, the the thing that we can do to make ourselves be successful and uh, to proclaim the gospel in the right way. Whether we are parents or teachers, or pastors, or CEOs, or elected officials, or even just members of the church, we all want to know, just tell me, what do I have to do to go from here? Just tell me where to go, and I'll go. Maybe it's time to let go of the idea that that correct answer exists, to start looking for the answer that works for right now, for us, here, even if it doesn't work for us tomorrow. Those answers can't be found in a class or in a seminar or a theology book or even in sacred scripture. They can only be found by asking questions and wondering together. In pining for the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden, Adam and Eve lost sight of the one who walked beside them. I don't believe that story ever happened. But that's because I believe that it's always happening. And that's what makes me wonder, could the promise of that fruit be blinding us to the great love that's walking right beside us?